Hey guys, welcome to Rhino Tactical's TST-3 for Rifles, which is Tactical Combat Rifle. Uh, one of the acronyms that I want you to remember is called SECTOR, and it basically stands for Simulate Training Close to Reality. So all the drills that you're going to see today that we perform, we're going to be wearing our plate vests, we're going to be wearing our sidearms, everything that you would wear when you get into the fight. So um, you want to do that whenever you go train. You want to so one quick little tidbit about stance is you want to use whatever stance is comfortable for you. Remember, everybody has different styles of grip, stance, weight forward, weight backwards, depending on what the situation is, what kind of arm, um, you know, small arm you have as far as lengthwise, if it has a compensator, if it has just a muzzle brake, flash highlight, whatever it is, different situations need different things. So you want to use what is comfortable for you. I want you guys to realize that this is going to be for stagnant marksmanship. Uh, later on when we get into moving drills and things like that, we're going to have a whole different set of requirements and things of weight distribution and things of, of how to do it properly. So this will cover basically just stagnant marksmanship for right now. And basically the way it works is this. Whenever you stand with a rifle, you want to stand the same way as a pistol. It's a little bit slight differences though. With a pistol, uh, remember I was saying stand, stand pretty much with your open target presentation to where you are completely parallel to the target. You guys are facing each other basically. If you're right-handed, your right foot will be slightly exaggerated back in pistol. If you're left-handed, your left foot will be slightly exaggerated back. With rifle, it's a little bit different. You're still going to stand forward, um, just like that. Feet shoulder width apart, weight on the balls of your feet. And what you're going to do is you're going to just exaggerate the pistol stance just a little bit. Take your right foot if you're right-handed or do everything opposite if, if you're left-handed that I'm talking about. So right foot slightly exaggerated back weight on the balls of your feet, uh, the feet are shoulder width apart, and you're going to lean slightly forward. You're not going to exaggerate your forward lean like you would in a really high recoil situation with a shotgun. It would be something like this. Again, if the rifle has a higher recoil, again, you do want to lean very, very far forward. So one of the things that this allows us to do if we don't over exaggerate the stance, like I was saying, a heavy recoiling shotgun or a heavy recoiling rifle, a subgun or something like that, which you do want to lean forward. Um, in other words, like this for those types of gun. If you go ahead and open up your stance, close your stance off, excuse me, a little bit like this to where I'm facing you, then it gives you, again, it gives you a greater field of vision it allows you quicker target transitions, it allows you to utilize your vest correctly, and it allows you high mobility from left to right, okay? Um, so basically the stance is feet shoulder width apart, uh, weight on the balls of your feet again, uh, knees slightly bent, you're leaning forward, gun, gun forward like that, and your head down looking, looking through the scope or looking over the scope depending on what we have. Now all the things that I'm mentioning are for, I'm doing it today as a right-hander. Um, if you're like me, you're ambidextrous, you can shoot right or left-handed, but just to make this easy today, I'm only going to do right-handed, so whatever I say, lefties, you want to just do the opposite. In other words, right foot back, you guys would put left foot back and so on and so forth, okay? Okay, so the next thing that we're going to cover is our grip. Now just like a traditional pistol grip, we're going to take our primary hand and we're going to put it up all the way under the beaver tail. Our finger is going to be off the trigger until we're on target and ready to fire. A lot of the grip is going to be done with our secondary hand. And there's different types of grips that I'm going to talk you through right now. We're going to use about four of the, of the many thousands that are out there. There's so many variations, but these are the four main ones and this is how they came to be. So the first grip we're going to talk about is the infamous magazine hold grip. Now this grip has been around for well over 30 years and it basically came around because a lot of the specialized groups that were using these types of grips had the H&K MP5s or the H&K PDW type of small submachine guns and they would use this grip because it was really, really efficient as far as doing CQB and room clearing exercises and things like that. The hands, the arms would be in slightly like this so you're not chicken wing ca catching yourself off a door jam or a uh, archway that you go through or something like that everything was tucked in tight the the secondary hand was directly on the magwell and everything was in tight so you can go in and you can do all the drills and everything and find your target and, and uh, neutralize your target immediately immediately efficiently um, there's a couple advantages and disadvantages to this thing the advantage to this would obviously be that you are in tight you're not going to catch anything uh, on your way in and a lot of recoil control here okay the disadvantage to this is that you can see the balance of this so inside is great but when you start moving out outdoors to um, you know field exercises and things like that where you're acquiring targets at a at a wider uh, a wider swing then what's going to happen is it's going to be really hard to stop 
to stop from left and right because of the balance of this gun as opposed to being out here. So that's how that grip came to be. Um, it's basically hand over magazine, arms in tight, you're not chicken winging, you're out here. And it's, it's, it's a great grip for um, CQB exercises and type of operations indoors. So the next grip we're going to talk about is basically like your police NRA grip. Now this grip is basically for um, marksmanship contests and things like that. It's not really a tactical or aggressive grip. But you'll see a lot of people do this where they put their hand flat up against the, um, the fore end. And just something like this. Now... This is great for maybe for marksmanship and for you know stagnant marksmanship, especially uh, non-tactical stagnant marksmanship, I should say. However, the disadvantage to that is you could see that I have no recoil control here. I, I'm not grabbing the gun. I'm not. All I'm doing it's it's just a shelf that my forend is resting on. The second thing is just like the magazine grip, this target to target swing is very very inefficient this way. So. I don't recommend that grip. That is a grip if you're just out plinking or you're just out doing off. I want to uh, kind of like sway you guys into like moving away from that type of police NRA grip. Again, that's for more for open field targets if you're out, you know, plinking and, and you want to shoot targets that are a far distance. So the next grip that we want to talk about is our offhand rifle grip. Now this grip is very, very similar to the other uh, police NRA grip, except instead of being like this, you're going to move your hand forward like this, and you're just going to grab the fore end like that. Now as you can see, these gri as these grips have evolved over the years, they kind of went from here and they start moving out, telling you that um, basically the wider the grip is, the better advantages you're going to so have. So the next thing we're going to talk about is our thumb over grip, and let me change guns for that so that we can see here. Basically, the thumb over grip has been around for about 60 years as well, and you'll see a lot of people hammer down on different companies um, that they say claim to have, to, you know, taken this grip for their own. And I want to defend a couple of those bigger companies. We know who we're talking about, and um, you know, I don't want to uh, say anything because I don't want to offend anybody. But Magpul is a good company, so shut up, guys. Anyway. That grip that those guys over there um, promote is not their own grip, and we all know it's not their own grip, and they know it's not their own grip. So, at any rate, what that grip is basically, it's the same thing. Instead of doing an offhand rifle grab right here, what you're doing is you're doing the same thing. You're extending it out a little bit further, and you're just putting the thumb over grip. Okay, this is, this is why I call this grip the Nifty 50, because it's been around for over 50 years, like we were talking about. But what this does, some people like to keep their arm straight and transition from left to right. That's actually the most efficient way to do it from, from target to target. It allows you fantastic target acquisition, and it allows you to stop on a dime. For me, that's a little bit too fatiguing. I like to bring my hand slightly in, bent a little bit, so I modified that technique a little bit, again, to suit my own, uh, my own purposes. Again, like I was saying before, you guys want to use whatever technique that we teach you, you want to use it to your best advantages, whatever body type, if you're bow-legged, if you're straight-armed, if you've got longer arms, if you've got shorter arms, use it to your advantage. So basically, that grip over the, uh, was, was developed many years ago. Thumb over the top. It allows great recoil control. It allows you great transitions from target to target. And it allows you great mobility. You can come up and you can uh, transition from left to right immediately. So that's the grip I recommend you guys do. Obviously, you can't do that type of grip with a shotgun because you're going to burn your, your, your finger on the barrel. But whenever you can on a rifle, see if you guys can actually grip it over the top. And you'll see that that grip right there is extremely extremely um, efficient and it's great for our target to target acquisition speed. So that's pretty much the history of where all the grips came from. Now one of the things that I want to remind you guys real quick about is don't rely on just one grip. You know if I'm doors, if I'm indoors doing a room clearing exercises for, for agencies I'm not going to go in with with a full you know straight arm thumb over grip type of thing or I'm not going to you know I'm going to modify it a certain way you know I'm not I'm, I can't be out here I can't be chicken winging if I'm inside a building the same thing I don't want to be you know like this if I'm outdoors and I need quick target acquisition so again you want to mold your grips learn them all learn as many variants as you can because there's going to be different situations where you're going to have to change your grip right-handed left-handed from short uh, cqb exercises to far field exercises so learn to use all the grips and you can utilize them uh, to their utmost advantage so the third thing we're going to talk about is our sight alignment now depending on what you have whether it's a scope or iron sights or an electronic dot sights Again, the situation will depend on, on you know, what, how you want to acquire that site. So basically, for a scope, we're going to talk about scope real quick. For a scope, you want to keep, keep your head down as far down as you can, you know, utilizing shots. You're looking through the scope, find your site. Use this knob here when you come up on target to actually drive this knob here towards your target. And then 
let the knob drop in, and then you're going to pick up your your electronic or your crosshair, whatever depends whatever you have on the scope. Um, one of the techniques that we use with a scope that's a little bit of a secret of the of the, uh, of the competitive shooters and as well as some of the police shooters, we use what's called dimming the scope technique. And what that is is all the time on close-up targets, we don't use our scope most a lot of the times. We do what's called dimming the scope, and that is basically again you're driving this knob to the target. And what you're doing is you're actually not looking through the scope. You're looking at just enough of the scope to where it dims it a little bit, but you could see your reticle, whether it's a crosshair, an electronic dot, or a chevron. And you're going to be actually looking over the top of the scope, and you're utilizing it like the, plane, the top of the plane of a shotgun. And um, that allows you to get on target real quick. You can get some quick, accurate snapshots on there, and it allows you to utilize your sights a little bit quicker. When it's further out, then we want to go ahead and drop our head back in and look, look uh, through the scope and use our, our dots or our crosshairs on it. But for a lot of close-up stuff, like we're saying, um, actually most of us tend to drive the knob to it and look over the top and dim the scope to where we could just look over the scope and then pop off the rounds that we need. So that's a technique that we use when you're utilizing the scope. Obviously the technique is going to change, like I said, if you have an electronic dot sight and depending on your situation. But, um, you know, so whatever technique what you, you use, whether it's, you know, over the top dimming the scope or actually looking through the scope, you want to make sure that your head is down as far as you can get it. You know, you'll see on these exercises that I'm going to do, sometimes my head doesn't even go down because it's just natural in the position and I'm just looking over the top of the scope. But the lower you are, the more of an aggressive stance you have and the more you have uh, command presence basically with the target and you can drive yourself and you feel a little bit more aggressive as opposed to doing this and bringing it all the way up here. You're aggressive, you're down, you're looking through your scope or over your scope depending on what you have. Okay, just remember that no matter what you have electronic dot sight or scope so the last thing we want to talk about on this little quick TST is iron sights a lot of us out there utilize backup sights um, made by different companies to um, go ahead and uh, take the place of our optics in case the optics go down and using iron sights on a rifle is very very similar to a pistol the closer you are to a target the more you want to focus in on that front sight and the further are you more the more you want to utilize and make sure that everything lines up rifle makes it pretty much easier because you're already looking when you're sighting down the top of the scope you're pretty much almost always looking through that back ghost ring to acquire that front target but there's basically um, no secret there you know what I mean if you if you've mastered the pistol then do the same thing on rifle um, again close-up targets front sight um, focus on that front sight. The further you are out, focus on your your whole entire um, sight, sight picture and sight plane. Um, the nice thing about these backup sights is, like I said, if it ever goes down in a combat situation, your your optic wise goes down, then these can just flip right up and um, you know take the place take the place of those things real quick, and you just rip off your, your your optic real quick. So I recommend you guys also get backup set of, of iron sights as well as your optics if you're going to opt to use optics. So So the next series of drills that we're going to do, we're going to be performing them with our AR-15 platforms and our AR-15 sim guns um, that are shooting dram rounds. So what I want you guys to do is every single time you guys see us shooting, I want you to visualize the cadence of the shots and how, you know, how quickly you can acquire the targets. But one thing I do want you to remember is remember, accuracy comes first. The slowest hit is better than the quickest miss. And what I mean by that is, in a combat situation, you don't have time to empty all your mags. You need one good consistent shot. Either take out the head, the heart, or the, or the hip area, which is your pelvic girdle. You want to do some sort of major trauma there. Uh, you don't have time to miss. So you want to practice utmost accuracy first. All the shots that you see us doing are within those, either the head, the heart, or the, um, or the uh, hip quadrant area. So you want to, again, focus on accuracy and really try to visualize. These things are... are are, are shown to you guys so that you can learn how to practice when you're out there with a real rifle or you can practice even in your backyard on any field or anything like that you can learn to practice with an actual sim gun so that way you're practicing whenever you want and there's no inconvenience of saying hey I can't get to the range or whatever you should be practicing dry fire you should be practicing simulation or type of simulated combat and you should be practicing when you get a chance to go down to the live range but all those three things combined make for a great uh, great exercise and a great training regimen so these next exercises we're going to show you how to do it and they're not all the exercises we're just showing you probably about i don't know five percent of what we actually train people with and they're all going to be performed probably about 60 percent we're going to do them fast but not so fast that you can't get you can't grasp the concepts so